very large granules. And what you're going to see is that some of these granules begin to fuse with the vacuole, even before it's completely formed. So keep an eye on this. Some of these are going to begin to pop. And what these contain are a number of microbial, antimicrobial molecules to their little pop. So it's delivering what's in them, these antimicrobial molecules against the pathogens. Now, this process is actually quite amazing. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you in the next slide is some um, um, really amazing intravital microscopy, um, which is technologically state of the art. <laughs> We're in the brain. White corpuscles are in the In the brain, this is all the electrical activity. Uh -huh. There were just the ship and everything in it. Stay here, Walter. Just hold them off as you pass. That's the bad guy. He's in the ship and he's crashed into the water. Of the Yes, sir. It's dirty, no. Get this on, quick. If a window goes, we'll lose this airlock. Take the side, smell the ship. site will uh, ingest the microorganism. Then we've seen that the granules in it uh, and some of its vesicles will actually fuse. And this delivers the antimicrobial components, things like lysozyme and proteases, into here that will then try and kill the organism. So that's one of the pathways. There's also a second pathway of killing that's quite important, which is oxygen dependent. So it turns out that in the wall of the phagosome, there's uh, an NADPH oxidase complex. It takes oxygen and generates oxygen radicals, from which you can generate hydrogen peroxide. Um, and these are very highly reactive chemicals, um, which will damage proteins and, and other molecules. And so this is quite damaging to the microbe, and it helps to kill them. So we get oxygen radicals. Um, we get this molecule here. Um, anybody recognize what that is? The you use it in your house, in your casa. So, bleach. We know that this is a very, very strong antibiotic. This is actually what your cells are generating. So, um, I mentioned that these cells generate these oxygen radicals. That's actually something that you can visualize uh, by staining leukocytes with a dye that will change color. So, this NDT dye is ordinarily blue. As more and more oxygen radicals get generated, it will turn red. So, you can actually see what this looks like. So, the first part of this video is without color, and so this is not very exciting. Um, and you're basically seeing a yeast particle here. There are leukocytes coming and uh, going to membrane around. But we'll see in a minute um, the, the same thing in color. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so it's the same thing. 
contacts and everything's loose, loose the flow its membrane around, and all of a sudden you see the oxygen radicals getting generated. And this process intensifies as the phagosome forms. Okay? And so you can imagine here that we're generating really, really reactive chemical species, and this is going to damage whatever is brought in here. So key points here, phagocytes ingest dying cells, debris, and microbes. Lysosomes and granules then fuse with the phagosomes, delivering antimicrobial molecules. Reactive oxygen species are generated in the phagosomes and also damage the microbes. Okay. So, how do the cells that are engaged in the microbes actually know that these are a problem and that they need to do something about it to kill them and engage them? So, how does it tell whether it's an amoeba or a pro? And the way that that's done in terms of general principles here is that they use a number of innate immune receptors. Um, and what I'm going to focus on are three families of these. There are others, but we're going to focus on three important ones. And these will be talked about elsewhere here in the meeting. So the first, which I uh, assume most of you are familiar with, are the toll-like receptors. Depending on the species, there's around 10 or so. The second are nod-like receptors, or NLRs. There are 20 or so of these. And then the third one we're going to talk about are the ring-like receptors. Um, and there are about three of these. So the leukocytes um, have various uh, ones of these. Um, you know, there are somewhere, vein to face, más o menos. Um, so there's a fair number of these receptors to recognize microbes. But if you think about it, the number of microbes that are potentially pathogenic to you or out there in the environment is enormous. Just think of the various numbers of bacteria or fungi, et cetera. The body only has 30 receptors to recognize this universe, this huge universe of microbes. So how does this actually work? And so um, how do a few innate receptors identify the large number of bad guys? So I have a little video here that will tell you the principle. I don't know how long all this works sound, but it's not a very high quality video. So say the guy in the side of the says, is an X. The guy says, Mas A is in Asia. Asia. Hey buddy, what's with the X? Um, para abierto um, gajapa. Then he's got gear and she says she's got, she's, she's got, she's got a chainsaw. Okay. So you can think of the woman in this video as the innate immune system. Right? <laughs> you can think about the guy as just an owner. He's a normal man. Okay. So how does the innate immune system see all of the bad guys? It's using an older, less sophisticated uh, solution to this. And what it's doing is looking for a few common features of the bad guys. So are they carrying an ax? Are they sharing this chainsaw? And if they are, then I'm worried about this. Right? So if we take a look at some bacteria, in the surface of bacteria, we divide these into gram negative and gram positive. Um, they have cell surfaces that are very different than our mammalian cell surface. So a gram negative has things like lipopolysaccharide, LPS, and a number of other um, peptidoglycan, et cetera. And the gram negatives have peptidoglycan, and lipopolysaccharide acid, et cetera. Um, moieties are, are molecules that are not found on our mammalian cells. So you'd imagine that if you designed a receptor to see lipopolysaccharide, that um, you would be able to recognize all gram-negative organisms, right? Even though they're very different from one another. But if you generated a receptor to see lipopolic acid, you could see all gram positives. And that's precisely what the immune system has done. You try to look for these conserved molecular patterns. Um, and it has deployed these various uh, receptors. It's placed them in different places. Some of them are on the cell surface. And so some of the cell surface receptors are the, some of the toll-like receptors, not all of them, but some of the toll-like receptors. 
And there are others we're not really going to talk about, C-type lectin receptors, scavenger receptors, et cetera. So the cell surface, toll-like receptors on the cell surface are shown here. Their um, molecular binding regions are these new series of rich repeats, uh, sometimes associated with other proteins. And so TLR4 with its associated proteins can see lipopolysaccharides. TLR5 can see flagellin, so a little tail on um, a number of pathogenic uh, bacteria. You can see all of those, et cetera. Now, these are important. Uh, in the human population, it turns out there are polymorphisms uh, in various these toll like receptors. So the sequences differ between individuals. And um, one of the things that's been emerging over the last many years is that those differences are actually important because it can predispose you to certain diseases. So, for example, there are polymorphisms in TLR2 that lead to increased risk of infections or, or, or worse infections with leprosy. So those are the cell surface receptors. Um, there are also some of these sensors deployed in the endocytic compartments, so where cells will drink in or eat things from the environment. It turns out that some toll-like receptors are found in the intracellular vesicles. These are TLR3, 7, and 9, as we'll be hearing more about. And it turns out that these all like to see various forms of nucleic acid. We'll hear more about that. You can imagine if you've eaten a microorganism, it may have nucleic acid, right? So it's important to sense. Then there are a number of these sensors that are actually in the other compartment, the cytosolic compartment of cells. And here, one of the important families is the non-like receptors. Um, there are a whole series of these. These are also heavily seen rich repeats. They're sort of like an intracellular toll-like receptor. And uh, what these are able to see are, again, some of the conserved uh, molecular components of bacteria, like the gramble on peptide, comes from the wall of bacteria. And it also turns out that there are polymorphisms in these um, uh, within our species, so variants. And some of these um, are associated with diseases like Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the other intracellular receptors that I'm going to talk about are the rig-like receptors, also called helicases. These are found present in the cytosol. And what these recognize, again, are nucleic acids, in particular things like double-stranded RNA, um, which is something that viruses make, but our own bodies don't sense to make. And so these are sensors of these, and they can sense when a viral infection is taking place. So the key points here are that innate immune cells recognize pathogens, with a limited number of binding molecules that see common non-cell features. And this then allows a broad detection of pathogens with a small number of sensors. And it actually works quite well. <coughs> so we've talked about there's some on the cell surface. That's one of the areas the body needs to deal with. Those are the certain cell like receptors we've talked about. Some are in the intracellular vesicles, another compartment that needs to be monitored, those are vacuoli toll like receptors. And in the cytosol, there's nod like receptors and the rig like receptors. Okay, so we've got these sensors. What do they do? What do they actually trigger? So we're going to look at that first for some of the toll like receptors and, and for the toll like receptors and some of the nod like receptors. So the like receptor on the surface gets engaged with lipopolysaccharide as a signal. That's also true of some of the non like receptors. And one of the things that it will cause to activate is a cytosolic transcription factor called NF kappa B. That when the, the signaling cascade activates this, it's released from its inhibitor, translocates into the nucleus. And since this is a transcription factor, it's going to activate the expression of genes that have the corresponding uh, transcription. Uh, Binding sites. So, what are some of the genes that are controlled by NF kappa B? Well, this is a partial list. If you look at this list, it's a who's who of what's important for inflammation. So, NF kappa B controls a large number of cytokines, including a number that are very important for inflammation, which is looking 1, 6, 8, DNF alpha. It activates chemokines that are important for hemotaxis, <coughs> tracking lymphocytes. It activates the vascular adhesion molecule, um, the antimicrobial defenses, et cetera.